In this episode, we're putting together all the animations and special effects for our speed and jump boost ability. Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode where we're continuing our speed and jump boost ability that we started last episode. Basically putting all the finishing touches on it, all the nice effects, the sound, the Niagara, all the fun stuff that you saw in the intro. So we basically have five pieces to this. We have the running fast animation, we have the jumping animation, basically simple arms extended just like this. And then we have the Niagara effect that's under the hands, kind of like a rocket being shot out, but really it's in the opposite direction because the air is pushing up into the hands. And then we have the sound effect when the player is actually gliding through the air and the effect is active. And then last but not least, we have the lovely cloud kind of supporting our overall player while the effect is active and the player's floating in air. And I thought about having these effects active when the player's running across the ground really quickly, and I just found it annoying. And any time where I have a gameplay effect where it's annoying, it just detracts from gameplay, cut it. Error on the side of not including it. But surprisingly, I didn't have that annoying feeling when I was gliding through the air. It was just a lot of fun. So here are all the free assets that we use this episode, and just like every episode, you can find a link to all these assets in the description below. There's a spreadsheet, and it'll take you right to it. Now, I considered using this really cool VFX pack that I got in the Unreal Engine Marketplace. It was a free asset for the month a couple months back, but ultimately, I want this series to be free as long as possible. And I was able to get the effect I wanted just using free assets. So we might end up using this pack in the future, but it's not needed for this episode. So here are the key concepts for this episode. Really, the only thing that's completely new to this series is what's called a blend space. And that's how we blend locomotion animations, really walking, running, and then sprinting animations based on the player's speed. We also use a lot of timers in this episode to avoid having to use event tick, and quite honestly I probably should have done this for our fire abilities also with the sound so that we're not having to use event tick there. So I might go back into our fire abilities at some point in the future and set up all of our sounds and effects to be off of timers instead of event tick. But regardless, by the end of this episode you're going to have a really good sense of how timers work. So let's get to it. So for getting our sprinting running animation up and running, I downloaded this fast run animation from Mixamo. And if you don't know how to retarget Mixamo animations to the Unreal Engine 5 mannequin, I recommend checking out episode 25. You only need to watch about the first six minutes and it has everything you need. The one thing to note about this animation, make sure you check the in place checkbox because if you don't do that, then you're going to need to enable root motion and do all sorts of complex stuff with that. And we're not covering that this episode, but everything else totally fine to leave as is. Overdrive, character arm space, the trim, totally fine. And then when I brought that animation in Unreal Engine and retargeted it, I now have a fast run for UE4 retargeted animation here. And this actually isn't the final animation that we're going to use for sprinting, and I'll explain why in just a bit throughout this episode. In the final animation, you can actually find a link in the description below and in the spreadsheet, as usual, where you can download it directly. But I want to show you how I went from here, this initial animation from Mixamo, to the final animation so that you could experiment with that yourself. Now the first question that we really have to solve this episode is how do we blend in this sprinting animation here with the rest of our running animations? And so I'm going to minimize this, I'm going to go into our animation blueprint. So mine's under content in this core folder that we set up all the way back in episode 3 of this series. So ABP third person character. And then in our animation blueprint we have to go under the anim graph and we have to go into our locomotion state machine. And specifically we have to go into our walk run state here. And all this stuff right here, you're not going to have that if you're not following along with this series, but that's totally fine. You can ignore it. So what you will have is this blend space, BSMM walk run blend space. And this is what's called a 1D blend space and double click to go into it. And what a blend space does is exactly what it sounds like. It's a way of blending multiple animations together via some sort of variable. Now there's 1D and 2D blend spaces. And this here is a 1D blend space. And the way I know it's a 1D is it's just one line across the screen. And it's using a single variable to determine how it blends. And you see here it says hold control to set the preview point. So I can hold control and I could just move our preview value and we see our character speeding up. And that single variable that's controlling how fast our character's walking or running or how fast they're moving in the animation that's this speed variable here. And I can see that speed variable by going to the axis settings, horizontal axis, expand that. So that's the name of the variable. The minimum axis value is zero, maximum is 500. So if he's running at full speed, that's when he's getting this animation right here. And you see the animations denoted with a diamond icon. And we can see those by expanding those here. So we have our MM run forward animation. This is our default run animation, and that's set to a speed of 500. And then we have our default walk animation, that's set to a speed of 230. And then we have our walk in place animation, which is set to to a speed of zero. Now we're never actually using that because our character goes back into the idle animation and that happens back in our locomotion state machine from walk run to idle and that's being determined by this boolean variable should move that's there by default on our animation blueprint. 
But to go back into the blend space, so the way we're going to do this is we are going to blend our subsequent animation that we just downloaded from Mixamo. So if I go back to content, it's under characters, I saved it under mannequins, animations, Manny, Mixamo, and then we got our fast run for UE4 retargeted. But the very first thing we got to do is we got to set, okay, how fast is our character going to be running in order for this animation to play? So if I pull this animation up, if I open that, so clearly he's running faster than a typical animation. And so I think a good value for this would be a speed of 800. So we could set this animation to play at a normal rate when the character's speed is roughly 800. So to do that, I'm gonna go back into the blend space. So back to AVP third person character, walk, run, expand the blend space here. And the first thing I've got to do is I've got to increase our maximum axis value here. Now I'm actually going to increase this up to 2000 because I'm going to increase it to the speed that I anticipate will be the maximum speed of the character throughout the game. All speed boosts, everything that they could get, that would be the fastest that they could move. So this is going to be 2000. And then we see the line here gets readjusted because even at the fastest speed that we currently have set up, that's only one quarter of the overall 2000. So now you heard me say that we want to set this sprinting animation to be a default of about 800 and then scale it up to 2000. So let me show you how we're going to do that initially. And we're going to run into problems, but then we're going to solve those. So I'm going to go back to the content drawer. I'm going to take our fast run retargeted. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click here, show a new content browser. And that way, when I have this window, what I can do is I can just drag it into the 1D blend space here. So I can see roughly how much the speed's gonna be. It doesn't have to be perfect around 800, and I could just drag in that animation there. And you'll see then we have a third, it's really fourth because it starts at zero. But we have a fourth animation here setting to a speed of 797. I'm just gonna change that to 800. And so to test this, I can just hold control on the line graph, and now he's moving a little faster. I'm just gonna hit play so I can actually see it. Yeah, so now he's walking at this speed, he's running at this speed, and then he transitions into sprinting at this speed. Now you notice something strange happening right here, and I'll explain what's going on there, but that's exactly what we gotta fix. But before that, let's also put an animation right here at that speed of 2000. So what I'm gonna do is back in our content browser, I'm gonna take that very same animation, I'm gonna drag it in all the way at 2000, but for the 2000 one, I'm gonna set the rate scale to be 2.5, so it's gonna play at 2.5 times speed. And then if I drag this over, let me just show you how this would work. So he speeds up, speed up, da, 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 da. it's kind of ridiculously fast. It looks almost cartoonish. So if you don't want this to go all the way to 2000, if you don't want this to play at 2.5 times speed, you could change that. So now the question is, why are we running into problems when we're moving from our run animation here over to our sprinting animation, our fast run here? So right about at speed 680 or so, player does this little like two-step dance move. Yeah, I don't want that in a regular game. And if we actually test this in the world as well, so I activate our airspeed boost, and yep, so it takes about a second for the character's legs to kind of move into the right position, because you'll see it, yeah. So that's the blend space problem right there, where it seems to be like sliding in slow motion, because it's not blending properly between the running animation and the running fast sprinting animation. So the question is, why is this poor animation blending occurring? And the answer has to do with the nature of the animations that we're trying to blend. So if I go to our run forward animation here, I can navigate to it with a little folder right here, and I click on that. So you'll see that there's a total of six footsteps in this running animation. But here's the thing. So if I go back to our blend space, and if I go back to our running fast animation, so go to that, open this. So let's play that. And actually what I can do is I can just scroll forward. It's one footstep, two footsteps, and that's it. So it's attempting to blend an animation that has six footsteps with one that only has two. And those aren't aligning properly because they're not occurring at the same parts of the animation. Now the good news is both animations start at exactly the right point. So you see his right leg is down here, and this is the running fast animation. And then if I go back to the other animation, if I look at that, he's basically starting in the exact same spot. So the way I solved this is I basically took the running fast animation, I repeated it three times, and I recorded that sequence for a new animation that was a total of six footsteps. And by the way, my way of doing this, it's really janky, and I'm sure there's a better way out there, so I'm gonna show you my way, and then so you don't even have to worry about it, you could just download the animation I made via the description below. But if you have a better way of recording animations directly in the engine, I would love to hear about it, so put it in the comments below. So let me show you what I did. So if we go to our content drawer, our fast run for UE4 retargeted, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click, we're gonna create an anim montage from this, and we can keep it the retargeted montage, that's fine. I'll go to that. So here's our montage. I'm just going to pause that and we see it starts with our right foot there, but then I'm going to open up my content browser over here and I'm just going to drag in a second animation all the way onto the end. So then we have two of them 
and then I can drag in a third, just like this. And so that gives us our total of our six footsteps. So let's play this now. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, just about. So now comes the janky part. So how do I actually record this? The only way I know how to record this, and I suppose I could have created a level sequence and created a brand new level and recorded it that way, but that seemed way too arduous, was I literally just hit record here, and then I timed it where it stopped right at the end. So I hit record, and then you define where you want to save this. So what I'm going to do is under Characters, Mannequins, Animations, Manny, Mixamo, and I'm going to call this our Fast Run for UE4. Uh, retargeted and I'll call it six steps. Now I tried using this end after duration checkbox and I could just put in however long this animation is in seconds and then it would work. But the problem is that if the animation's already playing, then I can't time it at the right starting point where the right leg is down. And if the animation is not playing yet, then I have to hit play and that messes up the duration because it's a duration from when I actually hit record versus the duration from when the animation actually starts. So in short, this is a pain. What I ended up doing is I just hit OK here and then I immediately hit play and then I have to time it right at the end. And then it says fast run for UE4 retargeted six steps has been successfully recorded 2.6 seconds. I can go back to my content drawer and then I can find it here. And so it starts at the right place now, but you see that the beginning there's nothing because I actually had to hit play. So then what I had to do is I had to find the place where it started like the first frame and then I had to right click on the pointer here and say remove frame zero to frame 32 and that was fine. The problem was removing the frames all the way at the end. For whatever reason, removing frames all the way at the end, it always somehow goes back to the reference pose. This never works for me to clean it up. So if anyone has any ideas there why I can't remove the frames at the end properly, so let me give an example. So let's say we're going to end right about here. So let's make sure I got the right steps. So we got one step, two step, three step, four step, five step six steps and that's where I want to end it like right about there it's at exactly the spot where we begin so I should just be able to right click here remove from frame 48 to frame 52 right so we remove those but let's take a look so it looks good looks good looks good looks good everything's fine but the problem is that the ending is not actually the ending I still have a couple frames here where it's doing more than it should be doing so what I ultimately had to do is I had to time the animation at exactly the right time by hitting stop record and only then did I get the proper six footsteps and that's why to save you the trouble of having to do this yourself I just have a link to the FBX file directly in the description below so what we're going to do, I'm going to exit out of this. I'm going to go back to my content drawer. We're going to delete out this animation, not going to use it, force delete. And so instead, if you download the FPX directly, what you can do is you can just take this fast run for UE4 six steps. You can import it in into whatever folder you want. And then when this pops up here, we got to select our Manny skeleton because I made this directly for the Manny skeleton. So it's the SK mannequin. Everything else should be totally fine. You don't need to mess with the translation or the rotation, and you could just say import. And then we could double click on our fast run for UE4, six steps. And there we go, we got the animation. It starts on our right foot and it ends on our right foot. Now I'm sure that the reason these problems haven't been solved in the engine is that 99% of developers out there do the common sense thing and handle animations completely outside of the engine, but I'm the crazy one trying to do everything within the engine, so here you go. So now we have to integrate this new six step animation in with the rest of our blend space. So for that, I'll go back to our animation blueprint. I'll open up our blend space. And then for the 800 speed, what I'm gonna do instead of 800 is I'm gonna switch this to 501. And that's the other thing that I do to blend from 500 to 501 seamlessly or as close to seamlessly as possible. I just set those two things to be right next to each other. So it's gonna be 501. And then what we're gonna do is choose our six steps animation. And I'm just going to set the rate scale to be a lot lower. So it's going to be 0.8 speed. Because you got to think, if this is intended to be running at like a speed of 750 or 800, something like that, then we want to reduce that somewhat if we're going to blend it directly from 500 to 501. And then over in 2000, I'm going to do the same exact thing. So I'm going to set that to fast run for UE4 six steps. And then we could test this out right here in the blend space. So I'm going to hit play. And now we're walking in place. Now we're actually walking. That looks good. Now we're actually running, running fast. That looks good. And then we're over to sprinting. And the transition is close to seamless. It's very quick. And then I sprint faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. faster, 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 faster. All right. So we are ready to save and test this out. All right. So I've got the air ability on our keyboard. I hit four. And yep, it seamlessly goes into the animation. 
but there are a couple of problems. So one is I'm not noticing any footstep sounds because it's using a brand new animation. And the second one is that if I hit four again in our keyboard, he's still going full speed. And the reason is we have our function for setting our footsteps back to normal speed based on each individual footstep itself. So we need to set up our anim notifies on our new animation for footsteps so that the normal things happen when he's using that fast run animation. So back in episode 19 is when we initially set up our footstep sounds. And now we have to go back into our Mixmo folder, the fast run for UE4 six steps. And we have to trigger the same six anim notifies, really the same two anim notifies for left and right foot that we did in episode 19. So I'm just going to pause this and we've got to coincide each of those footsteps with every place his foot actually hits the ground. So right about there is when we're going to play our first footstep sound. So I'm going to right click and say add notify skeleton notifies. This is going to be our left foot plant. Come over to our right foot. You want it right before it's about to hit. So right about there. And the reason the left versus right matters is if we have any sort of visual effects being at the foot, we want those to coincide with the foot, but also the sound. It should be a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. It's probably not going to matter for our player, but it might matter for other characters in the game. All right, air ability. And now we got footsteps. If I hit it again, and we're back to normal speed. So the next thing I want to solve is just the fact that starting to cast another ability like the Fireball, we're still moving at this crazy fast speed. It seems a little bit OP to me that we're still moving at a really fast speed through the air when we're casting another spell. And so when I actually cast another spell, I don't mind that the player's floating. I think that's a really cool effect that's going to have combinations of things. But I think it would make sense to actually reduce the speed of the player floating through the air. So let's do that really quick. So that's going to be back in our animation blueprint on the event graph, and it's under our end spell restore. So this is where everything goes back to normal. And right after we deactivate the ability, but before we activate a pending activation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set our speed back to the base run speed. And so I can get a reference to our third person character. So I get third person character, and we are going to get our base run speed that we set up last episode. And then I'm going to get a reference to our movement component. And from that, we're going to set our max walk speed, set max walk speed. And that is going to be according to our base run speed. Connect it up here. And then the last thing we're going to do is also from a third person character, we're just going to set walking back to false. So we're going to assume coming out of any spell or ability that our player is going to be running. And I'll just comment this and say set speed back to normal run speed, normal, normal run speed. Compile and save. Last test, then we're on to our real effects. All right, four, gliding through the air and very fast, spamming fireball. And now he's slowing down in the air. Still moving, but definitely slowing down. So now we can move on to our other effects. And the first thing is when our player is gliding through the air with this ability, I want his arms extended, basically like spread eagle outward. And so to do that, we're going to go back into our animation blueprint. And the first thing we need to do is we actually need to create a brand new variable. So the variable is going to be extend arms outward. And I'm going to categorize this variable under spell casting. And it is going to be a Boolean because what that is going to drive, if we come up here under our anim graph and we go into our main states, we're going to need to go into both the jump and the fall loop animation. But let's actually go into jump first. And we've done this before. Basically, we're going to use a modified transform bone node to extend the elbows out 90 degrees. And so I'm just going to make some space next to MM jump. And we're going to do a local to component. I'll move component to local over a little bit down here. And then from here, we're going to do a transform modify bone. And we actually need to do two of them, but let's just set up the first one first. So the bone to modify is going to be lower arm L. And everything's going to be ignored here except for rotation. So for the rotation, we are going to add to existing. And what we're adding is just the Z. And the Z is going to be negative 90 degrees. And that's what's going to move the elbows outward. And then the alpha, this is going to be driven off of the extend arms outward Boolean variable that we just created. So for that alpha input type, I'm going to switch that over to a bool value. And then we'll drag in our extend arms outward, get, and connect that up to enabled here. The last thing we're going to do here is we don't want those elbows to suddenly shoot out in zero seconds. So we want a blend in time and a blend out time. So it's going to be 0 0.2 to 0 0.2. And so then what we can do is we can copy both of these nodes. I'm just going to make a little bit more space here, paste them in because we're going to connect up this one here and this one here. And then this one is going to be our lower arm right. So I can scroll down a little bit, lower arm right. 
Now for this, because it's the other side, we got to change this from a negative number to a positive number. So make sure that this is positive 90 for the Z. So now we got to compile and save. And what we're going to do is copy all of these nodes from local to component back to component to local. And I'm just going to control C copy. We're going to go back to our main states here and we'll go into our fall loop. We're going to do the exact same thing. So regardless whether the player is jumping, like starting to jump or actually in the fall loop, then the player can do this exact chain of events. So MM fall loop is there. Output animation pose. We're going to move over here and just like that, compile and save. And so now we got to set up the mechanism that's going to switch this Boolean extend arms outward to be from false by default to true. And so for that, we're going to go back to our content drawer and back to our third person character blueprint. And we're going to go back to the event graph because we're going to build off of this air jump boost that we set up last episode. So what I'm going to do is under references, I'm going to get a reference to our animation blueprint. And then this is exactly where we're going to set it. So if gravity scale is 0.2, the arms are going to be outward. So set extend arms outward like that and connect this up and then that's going to be checked and then I can copy and paste it down here and then down here it's going to be unchecked connect this up here and make sure to connect up our Adam BP reference here I'm also going to extend out this comment so now we can compile and save we are ready to test this all right so when I activate it shouldn't matter when he's running but when I jump that's when the arms should extend outward all right here we go so running is good jumping his arms are extended outward and I stop jumping yep and then, yep, every time I hold spacebar with the ability active, then his arms are extended outward. Looking good. So now we're ready to go on to the Niagara systems and the sound effects. So let's navigate over to our content drawer and we'll go to content. We'll go over to Niagara, gameplay abilities, and then air, and specifically this air channel base that we started last episode. And I'm gonna right click and we'll duplicate and it's gonna be NS air channel. And instead of base, it's gonna be with UP, which stands for user parameters. And we'll go into that. I'll zoom in here and we're gonna create a new user exposed parameter under make new common. This is going to be a float and the float's gonna be called intensity. And we're gonna do another one, make new common and it's gonna be a bool and it's gonna be called spawn particles. And then over in our emitter for the distortion effect, I'm gonna disable the spawn burst instantaneous and under spawn rate here, instead of spawning 20 like that, we're going to do instead, I'll do a drop down custom float from bool, make custom float from bool. And the bool is gonna be whether or not we're spawning particles. If false, it's gonna be zero. And for the true, well, we want that to be a product of our intensity, basically the intensity of our gameplay ability. And the initial value that I tested this on was about 20. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this intensity divided by five so that we get roughly the same number of particles, 20 particles, when the gameplay ability has an intensity of 100. So instead of one here, what we're gonna do is divide float, and then it's going to be our intensity variable divided by five. So now we are all set for our Niagara system. We can save this. And now let's navigate into our actual gameplay ability. So I'll go back to content, blueprints, and then gameplay abilities and gameplay ability air. So I'm gonna zoom out on our event graph a little bit. We have to go up to where we're activating the primary air ability effect. And what we're going to do here is we're going to spawn two different Niagara systems, one for our player's left hand and one for our player's right hand. And so from our gameplay ability blueprint, so from our parent blueprint, let me just go into that really quickly. We're going to get our primary Niagara system. And then from that, from our gameplay ability pickup actor, that's what's going to spawn the Niagara system. So back in our gameplay ability air, we are going to get our primary Niagara system, get primary Niagara system, and we are going to spawn system attached. And we'll connect this up to the channel like so. Now, where are we attaching it? Well, we got to get a reference to our third person character, right? So third person character reference, get third person character reference. And specifically, we have to get our mesh. And then we can hook up the mesh to attach to component in the attach point name. So where are we attaching this? So it's going to be the hand L socket. And if you've been following along with this series, you should have one socket set up, I think for the right hand, but we don't have one yet set up for the left hand. So let's do that now. So if we navigate over to our animation blueprint and then over to our skeleton. So the way we set up a socket is we can come down here and under the hand L, so we'll just look very quickly. I don't see a socket there, but I can right click and this is where we're going to add a socket. And there's our socket, the hand L socket. And I'm just gonna reposition that. So I'm gonna move in a little bit more, Ooh, not that camera speed. And I'll go to select and translate. We're just gonna move that kind of down to the very center of our hand and just kind of zoom around the hand to make sure it's right, right in the middle of it. So right about there, that looks good. And we can compare that to the hand right socket that we set up. I think it was back in episode 23. So if we scroll down here, 
can do the same exact thing for a hand R socket if you haven't set that up already. So that's actually a little bit lower. So what I'll do is I'll go back up to our hand L socket and I'm just going to move that down a little bit further, right about there. And then we can save that and leave our skeleton. So back to our game playability air. So we've got our attach point hand L socket. And here, this is where we can get a reference to our components. So Niagara system one that we set up last episode, and we can set this and we're going to set it to be based on the system that we're spawning here. Now, in order to get this system in the exact location, I had to play with this a little bit, but the best location I found was about negative 20, negative 20 and Z equals 40. And we also want to make sure to check the auto destroy checkbox. And this just means that when the system stops spawning particles, it's going to auto destroy. So now we can duplicate this system and we're going to do the same exact thing for our right hand. So I'll hook this up here and I'll say hand R socket. And the location here is going to be a little bit different. So it's going to be 30, 30, and then negative 10. And this one will get a reference to Niagara system two set and we'll connect it up here. So now that we spawn the systems, now we have to tell the systems to actually begin spawning particles because as you recall, we're now using our spawn particles and user intensity to actually begin spawning the particles. So back in our gameplay ability air. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a reference to each of these Niagara system one, Niagara system two. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set a bool parameter, set bool parameter. And the bool parameter is going to be spawn particles. Now we're going to set that to be true. And we also got to do the same exact thing with system two. So I'll just move that directly next to it, spawn particles, connect this up here. And now we need two more references to Niagara system one and Niagara system two. And this is going to be where we set a float parameter. So set float parameter. And this is going to be our intensity variable. And I'm just going to move this up right here and the intensity variable Well, we can just right click and get intensity. And that's on our parent gameplay ability actor class. And the parameter name is going to aptly be titled intensity. Now when I can duplicate that we can do the same exact thing. So this is going to be Niagara system two, I'll make a little bit more space, get a reference to intensity, hook it up. So now we got this event all hooked up for our Niagara systems in each of our hands, but we actually have to call this event. So where do we call this event? So it's going to be in our third person character, but let's first compile and save this, go to our third person character. And then after we extend our arms outward, that's when we're calling the event. And so for that, I can get a reference to our activated gameplay ability. And then from there, I'm going to activate our primary ability effect, connect this up. And I'll just comment this and I'm going to say activate air ability jump effects, compile and save. And this is all ready to be activated, but now we have to set up the deactivation. So let's go back to our gameplay ability air. And what I want to have happen with this ability is I want the effect to diminish rapidly, but not instantaneously. So when the player lands or they turn off the ability, basically the effect is going to diminish, 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 and then drop to nothing. So to get that change over time, we need to create a new variable. So I'm going to go new variable here, and this is going to be called adjusted intensity, and it's going to be a float variable. And I'm also going to create a new function for this. So I'll go to plus sign here, and this is going to be decrement air ability effect. And basically the way this is going to work is every time this function gets called, it decreases the effect a certain amount, say 5%, but then it'll recursively call. It'll call basically every 10th of a second, something like that until it's gone. So I'm going to come over here on the right. And the first thing we need is our adjusted intensity variable. And then from this, I'm going to subtract five, change this to five. And then this value is going to be clamped and we're going to clamp it between well, zero at a minimum, but our maximum is going to be the intensity. And that's the variable that's setting well, however strong our effect is to begin with. So that's the max. And then from this clamp, then we can set our adjusted intensity to a new value. And I'll just reorganize this a little bit, clean it up. And then after this, that's where we're going to adjust our Niagara systems to be scaled down based on this adjusted intensity value. So I'll go back to our event graph. I'm just going to copy these two notes here. And we'll go back to decrement air and we'll pull these in. And instead of being the intensity, this is where we'll pull in the adjusted intensity, connect these up. And then after we decrement the effect, then we're going to check, okay, is our adjusted intensity still greater than zero? So is this greater than zero? And if it is greater than zero, then we're going to call this function again very quickly. So that's where we're going to do a set timer by function name. And the function name, that's going to be this exact name. So I can right click, say rename, I can copy that name, go into function name, paste it there. And the time is going to be 0.05 seconds. So 1 20th of a second after this is called. And basically that's going to end the effect very quickly. And then I'm just going to put a comment on this. So the comment's going to be if adjusted intensity is still more than zero, 
then call this function again in 0 0.05 seconds. But then what's going to happen if our adjusted intensity is equal to zero or less than zero? Well, we clamped it at zero. We clamped it back here. But if it is zero, then it's going to do this false pin. So in that case, what we want to do is we want to set the Boolean to spawn particles. We want to set both of those to false. So back in our event graph here, I'm just going to copy both of these and go back to decrement air, paste those in, connect up the false pin, and we're going to set both of these to be false. So the last thing we need to do here is we're decrementing adjusted intensity, but we never set adjusted intensity to anything. Right now, it's just a default of zero. So we got to go back to our event graph. And as soon as we do this chain of events, meaning we actually activated our ability, that's when we need to set our adjusted intensity to be equal to our intensity. So I can set this at the end of the chain, connect this up here, and we're just going to get our intensity value. Move this over, and I'll hook it up. And then the very last thing, we never actually call this decrement error ability effect function. And that's what we're going to do when we actually deactivate. So we do the atom notify and spell restore, but we still have to call that function. So decrement error ability effect. And that basically gets the recursion going. So whenever I say the word recursion or whenever you hear that in programming terms, it just means it repeats. And the recursion is it evaluates every single time. OK, do I need to do this function again? 0.05 seconds later. Yep, do it again. And then when it gets down to zero, boom, the whole thing turns off. All right, so we are ready to compile and save this. And the very last thing we got to do is back in our actual game world, whatever the pickup actor is. So here's our gameplay ability pickup actor. We need to change our ability primary Niagara system here from NS air channel base to NS air channel with user parameter UP. So save this and let's play. All right, so we activate our ability and jump. And now we've got our little gen engines on the ends of our hands. But the problem is whenever I stop jumping, I release the space bar. The effect does not go away. So how do we actually turn it off whenever we're not jumping? So let's go back to our third person character blueprint. And what I'm going to do here, if I zoom out, what's happening for this bottom chain of events is this is when we stop jumping. And so when the player releases that space bar, that's when I want the effect to start diminishing. And so what I can do is I can get our activated gameplay ability and I can cast to gameplay ability air. And you might be thinking, well, what if the gameplay ability is no longer active at that point? Well, that's fine, because when we deactivate the ability in our gameplay ability air event graph, if we actually deactivate the air ability, then we're going to call that function for decrementing the air ability effect. But we just also need to add it in our third person character here so that when we stop jumping, we do the same thing. So as gameplay ability air, then we can decrement the air ability effect. And if the activated gameplay ability is no longer an air effect, well, this casting is just going to fail, but that's totally fine. But we have to do one other thing here, and that's the fact that if we're spamming this ability constantly, then the new ability could start making more particles before the old ability diminishes all the old particles. And you could get this additive effect where the particles just keep growing and growing and growing and growing, and obviously we don't want that. So if we go back to our gameplay ability air, and we scroll up here a little bit, up to the activate primary air ability effect, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom out. I'm going to move all these over a little bit because as soon as that's activated, as soon as the activation occurs, what we're going to do is we're going to clear a timer by function name. And the timer that we're clearing is the timer for decrement error ability effect. So basically, we want to say stop calling this function repeatedly if we reactivate the ability. And the other thing we have to do is we have to set our Niagara systems to stop spawning particles. So I'm going to come over here on the right, copy both of these, come back over to the left, paste those in and put this right about here, connect this up, connect this up here, and both of these are going to be set to false. And what this is basically doing is it's resetting the effect no matter what, even if we're spamming it over and over, it's resetting the effect whenever we activate it. So we're ready to test this again. So compile and save. So four and yep, we get our particles. I stop and turn them on and turn them on and turn them on and spam, 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 spam and just spam it over and over again and turn the effect off and make sure it actually disappears after a short time turn it back on and what you want to test for is make sure you don't have particles that linger around indefinitely you want to spam it on and off constantly see if that messes up anything and if you do this and your hands are getting jiggy with it but the particles are staying roughly consistent then you're looking pretty good 
So now on to the sound effect for this ability. And for this, I used a combination of three free sounds, all from Zapsplat. And I'll just show you what I did. So I created a new folder under Sound Gameplay Abilities for Air and Air Channel 1, 2, and 3. And you can find all three of these linked in the spreadsheet that's linked in the description below. And so from these, what I did is I took the first two sounds, which are just the same kind of thing, but slightly different. And in the Air Channel queue, I just randomized both of those. And then I mixed those in with Air Channel 3. Just make sure you set all three of these to looping, randomize these, and then in the mixer is when the two different groups come together. In the output, I set the volume multiplier to 0.3, and I gave it a new attenuation setting. If you're unfamiliar with audio attenuation, I recommend checking out episode 17, which is the episode on environmental sound. But anyway, I'll go into this just to show you this. So I set the inner radius to be very small, 50, and then a fall off distance of 950. And then I did enable spatialization, made that binaural, which is better for headphones, and a binaural radius of 200. So here's the combined sound. So now let's set up the sound to actually play. So let's go back into gameplay ability, air. And then if we zoom out, so on the end of this chain for activate primary air ability effect, I'm just gonna go all the way to the end of this chain. We're gonna take our primary Niagara audio here, and I'm just gonna set the sound. And the sound is going to be our cue. So this is going to be our air channel cue. And I'll hook this up here. And then once we set the sound, that's when we gotta play the sound. So I'll take our primary Niagara audio again, and drag off a pin, and we'll play. And then connect this up. In the start time, I'm just gonna randomize that a bit so it doesn't start the same way every single time. So it's gonna be a random float and range, and the range is gonna be between zero and let's do 20 seconds. And then from here, that's when we're going to call our volume and pitch adjustment based on intensity. Because if you remember from last episode, I actually copied this blueprint from our gameplay ability fire, and we set that up back in, I think it was episode 27 with the flamethrower effect. So I can drag in a reference to that function, and then I'll hook it up here but we need to adjust this function quite a bit, so let's go into that. So it's good that we're keeping the is valid checks here, but then we don't have any curve value because there's no animation for this. We're just extending the arms with the transform modify bone node. So that means we can get rid of these three nodes here. And we also need to change this considerably because the way this is going to work is the sound's gonna start at something very low. So a very low volume like 0.05. And that's gonna be right when the arms are extending. And then it's gonna ramp up over time from that 0.05 volume all the way up to a full volume. And the ramp up should be pretty quick. Like it should be at most maybe one to two seconds. So we could do the same kind of thing that we did for the Niagara system, but just in the reverse, meaning we do a timer where it sets the volume to increment upwards over time. But once again, we need a second variable that we can increment sort of like adjusted intensity. So I'm gonna hit plus here, and this is going to be our sound intensity. And then I'll compile this, and that's what's going to start at zero, and then we're gonna increment it upwards in the function. So instead of all this, I'm gonna get rid of that, and we're gonna use our sound intensity variable, and we're gonna increment that by 0.02. And I'm just gonna move this over a little bit because what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna clamp and it's gonna be between zero and a maximum based on our adjusted intensity variable. So it's gonna be adjusted intensity. We have to actually divide this by 100 because otherwise it's gonna be, well, 100 times volume. We don't want that. And that's gonna be the maximum here. And then from here, we can set our new sound intensity. So set sound intensity, connect this up. And then from this, that's when we can connect it to the value here. And we can also connect our clamped value here to the maximum volume. And I'll connect this up here. I'm gonna keep the pitch adjustment exactly the same. So it's gonna be based on intensity and just very slightly based on the intensity. But at the end of this, at the very end of this chain, that's where we're going to once again do our set timer by function name. And our function name here is very long. So I'm gonna rename, copy it so I get it verbatim, paste it there. And the time for this is gonna be 0.1 seconds. So let's talk through how this is actually going to work. So our adjusted intensity, so this is going to start at whatever the intensity is when the ability gets activated. But as soon as we stop that jump effect, as soon as the player's arms come in, that's when the adjusted intensity starts coming down very quickly. And so our sound intensity, which is our sound volume really, that's also gonna come down very quickly because it's going to be clamped to our adjusted intensity. And at some point, the adjusted intensity is going to reach zero. And when that happens, that's when we need to stop the sound. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drag out all this stuff, make some more space over here. And the reason I'm doing that is because we're going to have another branch node right here. And this is going to evaluate whether our adjusted intensity is equal to zero. So if this is equal to zero, meaning that the effect is basically over, then what do we wanna have happen? If it's false, we want it to go on. But if it's true, I'm just gonna hold all, disconnect this. If it's true, what do we wanna have happen? And let me just move all this up to be in alignment with it. So if it's true, we actually wanna stop the audio. So I can drag out a pin and I can say stop. 
and that's going to be right here because at that point our volume is going to be reduced basically to zero anyway. And then the other thing we can do is we can clear our timer by function name and it's going to be the same exact function name. So right click rename, copy that, paste it over here on the right hand side. And last thing, and this is actually a cleanup. So because we have a timer and we're calling this every 0.1 seconds, this is actually a lot less performance intensive than doing it the old way, which is what we did in our fire blueprints. And that is up here in event tick on our event graph, we called it on event tick. We don't need that anymore. So I can delete out this, I can delete out event tick, compile and save. So let's test this out. There's one other problem with it, but we'll fix it very quickly. All right, so I activate our ability and then I jump. And then where's the sound? What's going on? So the problem is that this primary Niagara audio is playing at the location where the gameplay ability air actually spawned. And this was never an issue for something like the fireball because the audio was actually attached to our fireball actor rather than the gameplay ability actor. But this is an issue for our gameplay ability air and really we should fix this now for all abilities. So back in our third person character blueprint under our gameplay abilities here for our overall hotbar ability function. And this is where we actually pick up an ability. At the very end of this chain where we activate the ability, what we actually need to do is we need to attach our activated gameplay ability to our mesh. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag out a pin and I'm going to say attach actor to actor. And the actor we are attaching is under gameplay abilities, our activated gameplay ability. And the parent actor is going to be, well, ourself. And then the socket name, I'm just going to attach it directly to the player's pelvis. And we are going to snap to target. So compile and save, and we are ready to test this again. So now four, jump, and there we go. There's our sound. But the only issue is if I spam the space bar, and the reason that's occurring is because it's reactivating the ability, it's reactivating the sound every time we hit the space bar. And so the way we're going to solve this is at the end of the chain of activate primary air ability effect. So this is where we set the sound all here. And before we do this every single time, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make some space and we're going to get our primary Niagara audio here. And we're going to check to see, is it playing? Actually, I'm going to move it down, move this up here. Because if it is playing, then we don't need to set the sound and we don't need to play the sound because it's already playing. So only if this is false will it do this. And so I'm going to take both of these, drag these down. If it's true, it can just go right on to the volume and pitch adjustment based on intensity. So compile and save and let's test this again. All right, here we go. If I spam it, even if I spam it like crazy, it still diminishes back down to zero. So the last thing that's missing is the cloud under our feet. So let's do that. And so for this, once again, we're going to use a cascade system that's available in our starter content, and we're going to convert that to Niagara. So if we go under starter content and then particles, and it's this P steam lit here. So I'm going to right click convert to Niagara system, and then I'm going to rename this. So right click rename, and it's going to be NS small cloud underscore base. And I'm going to expand our Niagara folder over here, our gameplay abilities and our air. And I'm just going to drag this into the air folder. Move here. And so then we can go into our NS small cloud base. And once again, we need to acknowledge and clear issues. So we select our emitter, acknowledge and clear each one of these. You'll also have one down below. Luckily, we only have a single emitter here, so it's not going to take very long. So once we've cleared all these issues, I can set our spawn rate to 10. Then I'm going to adjust the add velocity slightly. So the add velocity is going to be between 16 and 32, but our Z value is going to be between 3.5 and negative 3.5. So basically nothing in terms of the Z value. I'm just going to uncheck the acceleration force here. And suddenly we have an emitter where it's just emitting, well, in a cloud. Last thing, under scale sprite size, what we're going to do is instead of starting it at zero, we're going to start it at about 0 0.5. And that way it just materializes in and then it gets bigger over time. So now we need a new socket to attach this Niagara system to. So I'll go back to our animation blueprint, back to our skeleton. And this socket, I'm going to attach it directly to the root bone. So I'll right click on the root bone and we are going to add a socket, root socket. And it's going to be right at our player's feet. So now we can go back over to our gameplay ability air and we're going to create a third and final Niagara system component. So I'll do add and Niagara particle system component. And this one is going to be our Niagara system base. And I'm calling it base because it's literally holding up the player. And so for this, I'm going to come back, come back over down this string and it's going to be right before spawning these other systems. And so I realize this chain is getting pretty long. It's going to get longer, but we are going to collapse a lot of this stuff to functions by the end of this episode. So I'm going to move this out. And then right here, after set bool parameter, 
Then we're going to check to see, okay, is our Niagara system base valid? So is valid, we're going to choose this one, the executable, and then connect this up here. And then also from our Niagara system base, we're also going to check, is it active? So first, is it valid? And then if it is valid, check to see, is it already active? Because if it's already active, then we don't need to spawn it again. So if this is false, then we're going to do a spawn system attached. In the attached to component, same thing as over here. So I'll get a reference to our mesh and our third person character, attach it here. System template is going to be our NS small cloud base. Attach point name is going to be the root socket we just set up. So root socket, set it to auto destroy. And then I can get our component, our Niagara system base and say set and set that right here. And then from this, connect this up here from true, connect it up here. Actually, I'll add a reroute right there and I'll just connect this up to the reroute. Also, if this is not valid, I want to hook it up and spawn a new system attached. And then in terms of making this cloud deactivate automatically, let's create a new function. So plus sign for that. And this is going to be the cloud is in air check. And if it's not in air, then the cloud's going to poof, disappear. And if it is in air, that's when the cloud's going to accumulate. So we'll get our Niagara system base. And first thing we always do is check, is that Niagara system valid? Connect that up. And then if it is valid, then we have to check to see, okay, is our third person character in the air? And so for that, we gotta get a reference to our animation blueprint, get ABP character reference. And then we can check to see is falling. So get is falling. And the other thing we should check is whether or not our Niagara system base is active. So we can also drag out a pin here and is active. And if both of those things are true, if it's falling and active, then we do an and Boolean, connect these up and then connect this up to a branch and then connect this up here. If these are both true, as long as the character is falling and it's active, then we're gonna call this function again in 0.1 seconds. So set timer by function. And so time, 0.1, and the function name, I can just right click rename and paste that in here. Now, if it's false, what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna destroy our cloud, right? Wanna make that go poof. So destroy component. We actually have a much cleaner way of doing this we're going to do, but for now, let's just make it disappear. And then last but not least, so if this is not valid, let's clear the timer. So that's just good practice. So we are going to clear timer by function and we're gonna get our function name and paste it here. So if that looks good, you got all of that, then compile and save and we are ready to test this. But before I test, I just decided for the gameplay ability pickup actor itself, I wanna switch the Niagara system display here because I think the cloud is just a little bit easier to see it's just going to be a better pickup. So we'll switch that over to the cloud. So before we test, one last thing I forgot to do. So this function, although we're recursively calling it, we never set the set timer by function name back on our event graph itself. So if we go back to our event graph and we got to come down past volume and pitch adjustment based on intensity. And I'm just going to paste that same exact thing here, connect this up just like this. And that way the cloud is in air check occurs immediately after the effect is activated. Compile and save. So we got our ability for jump. There's our cloud. And if I let go, when I hit the ground, cloud immediately disappears. Actually, it gets destroyed. So let's just do one last refinement of this cloud functionality. And instead of making the cloud just disappear suddenly, let's make it actually like poof a little bit. So back over to content drawer. And if we navigate over to content and then back to our Niagara folder, gameplay abilities, air. What we're going to do is we're going to make the NS small cloud base system. We're going to duplicate that and make it with user parameters. Cloud with UP. Go into that. We can close out of our base system and we can also close out of our skeleton. So we just need a single user exposed parameter for this and under make new common, it's going to be a bool and it's going to be spawn particles. And then for our spawn rate, you know what's coming. So we're going to make from bool, make custom float from bool. The bool is going to be spawn particles, and if true, it's going to be set to 10, and if false, 0. So the cloud is not going to be affected by intensity. It's just either going to be a cloud or no cloud. And then the last thing in here we're going to do to make the cloud suddenly go poof is we're going to add a set parameter directly node. So set parameter, set new or existing parameter directly. And the parameter that we're setting is going to be the particles age. And this is a little complicated, but I think we did the same exact thing back in the explosions episode, episode 31. But basically our particles age is going to be make custom float from bool. And the bool is going to be whether or not spawn particles is true. And if spawn particles is true, then the particles age is simply going to be the particles age. But if false, then we're going to do an add float. And the float we're going to add is we're going to take our particles age and we're going to add something to it. 
So the B here, this is where it gets tricky. So we're going to divide float, and then the A is going to be a subtract float. And we're going to take our particles lifetime. So particles lifetime, and from the lifetime, we're going to subtract the age. So how much is remaining? And then we're going to divide that by 10. And so basically what this is doing is every single tick, if we're no longer spawning particles, then it's going to do this. It's going to take our particles age. It's going to figure out the difference between the overall lifetime of the particle and the age, divide that by 10, and it's going to add that to the particles age. So the particle is going to be aging very quickly. So let's save this and the last couple of things we need to do. So our gameplay ability air over here. Let's go back over to where we spawn this Niagara system. So it's over here and we got to set this to small. If I just search for cloud, then I can set it to small cloud with UP. And the other thing is you might have noticed that the cloud was a little staggered off to the side. I'm just going to put it right smack in the center of our player and make the X negative 20. Make sure that the cloud's now set to auto destroy. And then what we got to do is we got to make a little bit more space here. I'm going to zoom out and take all of this and move it over to the right. Because what we want to do right here is we want to set our Niagara system base. We want to set a bool parameter and the parameter that we're setting is to spawn particles. This is going to be connected up there parameter spawn particles and we want to set this to true. So now where are we going to set this back to false so it stops spawning particles? That's going to be in the cloud is in air check. So we'll go into that and instead of destroying the component, this is where we're going to set our bool parameter. And again, this is going to be spawn particles and this is set to false. Connect this up. The last thing we need to set up here is as it currently stands, if I release spacebar in the middle of the air, the cloud is still going to be there because the player is still going to be is falling and the ability is still going to be active. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assess in the decrement air ability effect function. So all the way at the end of that function, I'm going to assess what's our gravity scale. And if our gravity scale is above 1.7, so it's back to normal gravity, then what we're going to do is set that bool parameter of spawn particles back to false. And it's going to make the cloud go poof, even if the player's still in air. So for that, I can get a reference to our third person character, get third person character reference. And then from that, we can get a reference to our character movement component, character movement. And in character movement, we need to get a reference to our gravity scale, get gravity scale. And if gravity scale is greater than, greater than, let's do 1.7. And then we are going to branch. And I'll connect this up here just like this, but I'll also connect this one up. Actually, I'll add a reroute and I'll connect it up just like that. If that's true, then we can get our Niagara system base. And from that, we can set our bool parameter. And for parameter name, just set this to spawn particles. And actually what I should probably do before I set this is just check again, is it valid? Always check, is it valid? Only if it's valid, then we'll do that. And I'll add a comment to that effect, and I'll say checks to see if player is falling normally, and if so, disperses cloud effect. So let's compile and save, and hopefully, hopefully, final test. All right, so I got my air effect and running. There's the cloud. It's directly center underneath my feet. If I let go of spacebar, poof. And then let's try again where I actually land with it. Poof. Yeah, and the other effect stays a little bit, but then it also goes away with time. The only thing I don't like is the amount of time it takes the sound to disappear and then come back. So for the volume and pitch adjustment based on intensity, I'm just gonna change this timer to be 0.03 seconds. So now, yeah, it just scales up the sound a lot faster and also disperses the sound a lot faster. So to finish out our episode, back in our gameplay ability air, we have this huge string of events for activate primary air ability effect. And let's consolidate a lot of this stuff into functions. So the first thing is these three nodes after channel. So I'll right click on these, collapse to function. And this one's going to be called, if I rename it, it's going to be reset air Niagara systems. And then if I move over here, so Niagara system base all the way to the set bool parameter, we're going to do the same thing, collapse to function, move this over. And then if I rename this one, it's going to be the cloud Niagara system spawn. And now on to the next set, if I zoom over everything from here, our two Niagara systems for the hands onto this set float parameter, everything from there to there, right click collapse to function. And I'll also move this function over. And we have our cloud Niagara system spawn. This one's going to be air Niagara system spawn. And then I can move all this over. It's already looking a lot cleaner, but we've got our sound stuff. So all of this stuff starting with is our primary Niagara audio playing. We can collapse all that to a function. 
and I'll call this one, if I rename it, the air sound spawn. And I'll move over our set timer by function node, and I'll move over these three, and here's our final product, so a lot cleaner. And we're beginning to get a lot of functions in our air ability. We might need to categorize these soon, but let's hold off on that. So that concludes our episode for today. But in our next episode, we're setting up all of our fall animations and effects. So I hope to see you there.